next 50 minutes or so to um, provide a uh, yeah, quick glance uh, at design thinking as a methodology. And as you might have heard already in the beginning, there are different wisdoms around and uh, different interpretations of what design thinking means. And this is just my own personal interpretation uh, that I gained over the years. And uh, I would also like to invite the community. So especially looking to Matteo, to Marco, to Tomas, and to many others here on the call. Uh, if you would like to add something, if you would um, like to maybe put up a, a contradicting opinion, so feel free. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be a monologue of mine. Uh, it can be also um, a, a kind of research talk that is helping you as students, as new ones uh, who are joining this program to better understand what the commonalities are and where even maybe we as faculty uh, see different things in that um, in this mindset and way of thinking. So by uh, saying that, the uh, learning goal for tonight is that you get a rough overview where it comes from. And uh, you have, have heard already a few stories about uh, sugar, but uh, this goes more back on, on design thinking itself. Um, and then I would like to introduce you to three different views on the design thinking approach. It's the mindset uh, view, it's the process view, and it's also the view uh, of design thinking as a set of different tools. And to do this, I will show undergo a lot of very practical examples. Most of the photos that you will see are coming from uh, either student projects or projects that I have done uh, by myself uh, during my professional career, uh, just to make it a bit more easy for you to understand. So all the theoretical parts I skipped a bit uh, so that you have at the end, hopefully, a practical overview of what it uh, can be as part of your project. And at the end, we can have a Q&A. So please uh, use the chat maybe to ask questions. If there's an urgent question in between, so like you didn't get it really, um, just turn on your, uh, your, your microphone and just ask a question on the go. Good, so I think now we are ready to start with, right? Um, so let's talk maybe briefly about the history where it comes from and um, basically, if you look at the literature, which is uh, quite formidable, so there, there's a lot of uh, research available around this method set, then basically all the literature points to just a few spots uh, globally where it comes from. And one of the main spots where we mostly have inherited also all the wisdom and methodological knowledge that we have is uh, Stanford University. And that's basically the shot uh, from Palm Drive uh, to the university, to the heart of the university. And if you look at the picture, uh, the famous Center for Design Research is just behind the trees here. So it's really close to there. And it started around in, in the 70s, 80s of the last century when the mechanical engineers, that was the domain where it started, realized that it might be not enough to educate their own students with um, technological knowledge and uh, helping them to understand uh, all the different how questions, so how to solve problems. But they realized that engineers would even become better if they would have a profound understanding what kind of problems they are solving. So, uh, and, and this kind of understanding roots back to all the why questions. So this, from today's point of view, makes absolutely sense, right? If you don't understand why you should solve something, then it's very hard to design something that solves the problem, right? But at that time, and even from my practical point of view, sometimes even today in corporates, um, it, it, it's not there, right? So people start more with uh, solving the, the how instead of thinking about the why. So in order to solve this why problem, they got basically in contact with other disciplines who were already better in understanding such problems and the problem space, like marketing department, psychology, ethnographers, and many other disciplines, including designers, were much better prepared than at this time the engineers to um, yeah, elaborate what, what the why is. 
And here it started when, uh, when they basically invited um, other lecturers also to give lectures around um, this wide question. So, but at this time, this class was not called design thinking. There was no one saying or telling it, um, or calling it design thinking. It was a course called ME210. So maybe nowadays you know it as ME310, but um, it was downgraded at that moment. And then later uh, it got a better course number at Stanford called ME310. So this kind of mindset sneaked through to the industry. And there are a lot of famous products um, that you might even know uh, who got designed with that methodology and mindset in, in mind. And maybe the first one that was, at least to my knowledge, very well documented around is uh, Apple's mouse. At this time, Steve Jobs invited the uh, today's very famous David Kelly to be part of the team for designing uh, this pointing device for computers. And for sure, Apple was not the inventor of the mouse. It was, was Xerox Park, but um, I think they did the invention of having a mouse that looks handy and that looks practical. And even from a today's point of view, I think it's a, it's a nice and shiny product. But also the first iMac. I mean, just asking maybe around, what was so impressive for that product here, for the iMac product? Why was this innovative? What, what kind of problem did it solve for the first time? Who wants to say something? If no one says something, then I take someone. <laughs> we just look around. So what problem is it solving? Gustavo, asking you. And on the chat, a few people responded. For ah, okay. I, I, ah, okay, let me see if I can. Is the space all, all in one or it has, it has everything in one place? Okay. Okay. So, so, so the all in one, so, but what is special about the ah, fewer cables? Here I see it. So, and that's the point. I mean, maybe you don't know these times, but when I was growing up, uh, we had always separate monitors, separate uh, PCs, and everything had a cable, at least one, uh, most probably three of them. And all the devices, they looked horrible. Right? And this was also one of the reasons why no one put his PC in a, in a nice and shiny room, because it just didn't look like pleasant and nice. And through user-centered research, Apple was able, and for sure some brilliant engineers, to figure that out. And they found a pretty nice solution. This device here had just one cable. That was also one of the selling reasons when Steve Jobs brought this PC to the stage. Um, he just showed that one cable is enough to, to power the engine and uh, you don't need many more. But also a lot of other inventions uh, were done with this uh, novel approach uh, that came up in the 70s. And um, until a fairly long time, most of them were physical products. But even if you look around nowadays, um, I mean, maybe you know Airbnb uh, got helped out by design thinking. So if you Google it, if you look at it, then you can read the story. But also well-established companies, I just picked here a ger very German one. Um, uh, it's called uh, Georg Fischer. They participated last year in the sugar program and they're famous for plastic pipes of all kinds and the world market leader for such pipes. Even they are picking up this method set and mindset to uh, work on future innovations. So who is the person behind? And there's a kind of um, yeah, father of the network and it's still a source for inspiration of all kinds. And uh, his name is Larry Leifer, and he's yeah, in his seventies and still a very active professor at Stanford University. And I hope that you also get a chance by mid of next year to meet him personally. Um, I think he's a role model for almost everyone in the community, not only because he 
uh, co-invented this method with uh, some other folks at Stanford, but also because he, he managed it to stay curious and he managed it to stay young um, uh, with his perspectives and, and uh, views. So uh, just look around, um, he's, he's uh, quite much into that topic. So now what is the framing of design thinking and uh, how can you look at it? And I introduced this already in the beginning um, that uh, we have three different lenses and these three different lenses based basically on the model that I will show in a minute. So let's imagine if you look at this slide here that you have this area of familiarity. Um, this is a space where you personally and intellectually feel confident of what you do. So this is called familiarity. So you, if some, someone is asking you um, a question, you might be able to answer it properly and also with a lot of confidence and trust that what you have said is, is uh, yeah, true and is based on facts. Um, in design thinking, for sure, we value this, this area of familiarity and it's important to have at least one area of such. That's mostly the discipline that you're studying it. But on the other hand, we know that innovation only happens if you leave that space that is surrounding you, that feels nice and cozy and warm. So you need to conquer some new spaces and new areas that you are even not familiar with, right? And for sure, that leads to uncertainty, that leads to um, sometimes a strange gut feeling because you sometimes just don't know exactly what is going on. But we know that you increase the le level of discomfort for yourself, you're in a good chance and in a good mood that um, you're able to find something that's new. And there are also high chances that you find something that is, um, yeah, uh, sparking and, and uh, finding its way into products and services. So this is the reason why uh, we have in the first place, if you look at the new graphic here, uh, in, in design thinking, a phase that is called diverging phase. Surrounded, it's surrounding this area of familiarity with an area of discovery. So all the teachers I'm sure around the globe will help you to leave that space of familiarity and to discover new spaces. And this usually starts with your challenge. You might really get hot challenges that you never heard about. So this is also already leaving this comfort zone and it creates discomfort. But this is part of it. If you don't leave it, you will never discover something really new. So this is basically a mechanism that we apply intentionally to you. But I mean, it wouldn't lead to a great innovation or to a great product, innovative product at the end, if you would not add another phase. And we call this phase converging phase. This is the phase where you start consolidating everything that you have learned as part of your diverging phase. And then you bring it back to something that is familiar to you and that is maybe familiar to uh, many other people or at least um, the consumers and users of your future product and service. And uh, this is happening as part of the converging phase. And uh, believe it or not, uh, organizations even nowadays are pretty much good in converging. But uh, what they sometimes lack behind is this diverging aspect. It's not very um, likely that in an organization you are allowed for a prolonged time to diverge, to look around, to be not fixated on one single solution, but being able to try out many things. And this is what we teach you to, to be able to do that. And also hopefully later to take this philosophy and mindset with you to organizations, because in order to become and stay innovative, you need to have this diverging aspect in everything. And here you can also map um, the two or two thought, thought schools. One is on the right-hand side of this slide, the how, what I 
addressed before when I was talking about sandbox. That's the typical corporate thinking. Everyone is talking how, how, how. So how can we do it? How can we make faster? But what we are trying to teach you on top of this as part of our design thinking curriculum and human-centered design curriculum is to understand why. Why should we do it? And maybe are there even other ways to um, that cause that problem? And instead of focusing on the problem that was maybe mentioned in the first place, we can then focus on the real problem, on the root cause. So we will teach you a set of um, uh, uh, things, so behaviors and, and process steps that hopefully enable you to, to answer the why. And that requires an ability of you that we call uh, dealing with ambiguity. And dealing with ambiguity means that why you diverge in those processes, in, in, in those projects, you might face situations where not everyone can tell you the exact truth. So not your teachers, not your teammates, and sometimes even not the best experts. But this is what you need to go through. Right? You need to find the truth as part of this diverging uh, process. What we can then do is to coach you finding <clears throat> hopefully the right methods and, and tools um, to get along there. Okay, so let's look into the three different phases. The phase number one <clears throat> of design thinking um, is what we call mindset. And I will dig deeper in a minute about it. So this has always to do with the way how you look at things, the philosophy that you bring to the work, and also how you, how you yeah, culturate um, your work. The second lens that we have <clears throat> is the process lens. And uh, sometimes I have uh, even conflicting talks with other friends and academics, uh, also within the Schopen Network, uh, who tell me, hey, Falk, uh, uh, what is that process? Right? Why do we need that? Uh, isn't it enough to have the mindset in place? And my argument on the process view is <clears throat> that for sure, if you became a guru, if you reached a certain level of intellectual maturity for design thinking, then I also agree that you don't need a process and you don't need a rule book that tells you do step one, two, and three. But what I experienced from my own practice and also by talking to a lot of students, a process helps when you don't have the mindset or when you're not already there fully, and when you start with something that's new, then a set of certain steps and activity helps. And I will introduce you quickly how our process model looks. And for sure, when you become um, a kind of advanced user of this philosophy, if you're even a guru, don't talk about the process. So you, you have the right mindset. But maybe in the beginning, the process might help you. And then the third view, which I will not address too much today, are the tools. So the tools are handy things like an empathy map or a customer journey that help you to run through the process and to act out the mindset more effectively and efficiently. And depending on your own domain and ex expertise, the tools might differ. So people are trying to, to write books about fixed tool sets but don't believe them. They, they can never capture all the tools that exist. Um, but for sure, uh, certain tools can help you throughout the process, but uh, do not believe that uh, the set of tools is, is endless uh, or uh, has no end. So let's start with the first part, mindset. And I think um, I addressed this in, as part of my opening speech already the interdisciplinarity and intercultural aspect. Um, this is super important when we talk about design thinking projects. And it's not just because we want to hang around with other uh, people, but because we know that having team members around you 
who have different perspectives on the same theme is helpful. And for sure, um, it also creates conflict in the beginning because if you are five and every one of you have a different opinion then you have five opinions sitting on the table. Yeah. So how do you find a concept? And this is pretty simple because better you don't look for content in the beginning of such a project. Better you listen to every of those different views and you accept them as a truth. And then try to find the common ground that is combining the different lenses. Try to seek for the opportunities in those different viewpoints. This is what interdisciplinarity brings in. And for sure later, when such a project moves into a converging phase, so if it leaves the diverging phase, then uh, you can use interdisciplinarity to distribute work and to implement your things faster. So always value that you are surrounded by different minds, different cultures, and different disciplines. Never see it as a problem or a challenge. It's a value and it's a gift. And I, I can bet uh, with you that you will think about this um, uh, very much later as part of your work career too. So the second mindset ingredient is um, that we believe in teamwork. And I mean, for sure we have responsibles for certain things in the team, like uh, finances, uh, those things, they, they need to be administered. But when it comes to, to um, build actually and think actually about the wise and the house, um, we proactively believe that we need to have a team. And at Stanford, there's an admired colleague, her name is uh, Kathleen Eisenhardt. She did a lot of work around um, high performing teams. And she figured out that the small teams with a size between three to six, three to seven people are performing the best. And especially when they're interdisciplinary, cross gender, sometimes also cross age, by the way, which could be an indicator to invite the corporate liaison sometimes as well to your work. Um, and they, they perform the best when it comes to um, creating innovative productive outcomes. And I think it's very nicely shown in that picture. This was a paper bike challenge in China. Um, but this one here is, is, is also quite nice. Uh, it shows basically uh, a, a project here on the board, you see it, uh, 2013 it was, uh, which we have done together with uh, UBS, the Swiss bank. And uh, again, it's all about this radical collaboration, having such war rooms where people um, yeah, intensively work together and collaborate with each other. And it's this debating culture that is uh, conveying uh, or it is important as part of those uh, discussions. So then uh, another one is that we strongly believe in making things. And this photo was taken at the Center for Design Research at Stanford. And I think the poster's hopefully still hanging there at the place. It's in the middle of the atrium. And uh, as you can see, nothing is a mistake. There's no win and no fail. There's only make. And what that means is that we believe in radical prototyping. So instead of over talking, over discussing things, we believe that it is much simpler to produce something quickly in terms of a low fidelity prototype, and then to challenge that prototype with your customers, with your stakeholders, but also with your own team. And the reason is that, and maybe you can empathize with that, it is very often hard for people to understand an abstract idea that is maybe written down on a post-it because it still leaves a lot of room for interpretation. And then talking about this abstract idea is not productive. But if you start building it, you make it concrete and then you can talk about it. The other advantage is prototyping itself is also a way of thinking so that means that when you prototype, as soon as you start prototyping something, you 
you start thinking about the solution already and you try to, or you will start thinking even beyond the initial idea. So it helps you to make things better. So we have this uh, bias towards action. Here you see one of my former students, I think this was in 2010, in the middle of this uh, gambling machine, right? So we have as our philosophy, this bias towards action and this culture of prototyping. So instead of talking, go to the workshop, go to your lab, start building it. No matter if you're an engineer, like here at Stanford where people really build on machines, or if you're a software engineer, turn on your computer, build a markup, build maybe a simple backend architecture, try out some algorithms, move on. So then for sure, this human and empathic mindset that um, we uh, show people things and uh, we are trying to get a capture of their feelings in order to understand this why reason. So we, we, we need to personally leave our own sphere and our own culture in order to understand uh, their people's rationale. So it's very much important in that philosophy. And then iteration and again, radical collaboration with your partners. That's a former project we have done with Generali, an insurance uh, where the headquarters in Italy. Um, we, we not just take it for granted if we have one solution figured out, but we iterate. We challenge the solution with our corporate partners who are here in the, in the center of the picture. And then we iterate based on the feedback. And that chart is uh, yeah, maybe the most important one, defining the gravity. And who can be your gravity, right? You might ask yourself. In the first place, it's maybe you holding yourself back, right? But then even your corporate partner, right? I mean, don't forget, they also have their bias and they have their experience and they might argue with their experience that something will not work. Hmm? Be suspicious in this regard. Try to um, yeah, defy that gravity and also sometimes try to defy the gravity of us and I'm meaning us as faculty. I mean, we are also just human beings, right? And we do our job and why should we know sometimes something better than you? Maybe not. And maybe you're right. So be aware of the fact that everyone who is giving you feedback and advice is also creating a field of gravity that might hold you back, right? So for sure, there needs to be a limit, but um, the limit shouldn't be zero. Okay, so that's about the, the mindset um, that you hopefully build up if you don't have it already. I'm sure some of the mindset points, they're already embedded uh, within you. So let's now talk a bit more about the process for the last minutes of that talk. So when you look at the process view, um, then um, there's one definition that always conveys us, um, that design thinking is a human-centered method for solving wicked and ill-defined problems of the real world. And we also know in between that design thinking can not only be used in business to consumer settings, so B2C, but also in B2B settings. That means business to business, so within the business. And I know uh, the sugar community has a mixed set. So some of you will have a B2C challenges, other ones, um, for example, sample from Nestle, they, they gave a B2B challenge, a typical one. So what is the process model that we teach? And I uh, do not take this for so much granted because some schools have a slightly different um, picture for that. And uh, we at HBI, uh, we mainly use this five-step model as part of this program. Uh, others might use a six-step model. So um, don't get confused if um, this, is not, uh, uh, this is not the only one. So, um, and I guide you through each of those points in a, in a second. 
So, but what you can already see at this picture, uh, whatever I will show you in a minute, uh, needs to be seen as an iterative process. So you never do such a step like need finding or ideation once. You always do it multiple times. And for that, your faculty has a teaching plan available and, and basically running in the background that is ensuring you that you have multiple iterations across the entire project. So let's maybe have a look into each of those bubbles, what it means to give you a gut feeling and a, and a, yeah, at the surface sense for it. So let's start with need finding. So need finding is some activity um, that for sure cannot be done at home. Um, so at least uh, not at home in the sense that you don't do digital calls, right? I mean, Zoom can open the door to the world. Um, but in a real world setting, um, we are always aiming, no matter what kind of challenge we are solving, to get out in the field, to get our feet across the corporate doors or the university doors. And uh, this picture here was taken in 2014 when we have done a project for Merck Pharmaceuticals. And we were investigating in certain drugs in developing countries. And as part of this challenge, we figured out that not only patients and medical doctors were relevant, but also so-called witch doctors. So they, witch doctors, uh, they, they believe in um, natural medicine based on herbs, so traditional remedies, basically. And in order to, to decipher what your challenge means, you really need to put yourself out into the field. Even if your challenge looks simple, and easy, believe me, as part of your field research, you will always see things from a complete new perspective and, and view. And as part of this need finding, we do on one hand side, uh, different interviewing techniques that you can apply, but we also do a lot of observation techniques. So really looking around, looking at things basically. And some other teams, um, like in the industrial sector last year and the year before, we worked, for example, for BMW. The teams even hired as interns at BMW just for a week to learn what it means to be there, to be in that environment. So it's all about this empathy gaining uh, and empathy uh, creating part. And this, again, can happen for all kinds of products here. Um, we, we tested out new ways of digital support for uh, pharmacies in rural areas in, in Kenya. But we also go to laboratories, to uh, corporates internally. We look at their manufacturing floors. We look at what they do and how they do it. Um, so the scenes are really quite different and they depend on what kind of challenge you are dealing with. So then the second step, we call synthesis. And the synthesis is uh, consisting of two main steps. First of all, um, as part of the synthesis, we try to collect what we talk, what we, what, what we uh, call um, uh, field research. So as part of the need finding, so when you go out for observation uh, or for interviewing, you collect data in form of photos, in form of transcribes in form of whatever was said. And maybe this is an extreme, but it's not a very big extreme. So I've been working um, quite extensively with IDEO teams in the past, and this is how they operate, basically. So here on such boards, uh, you see photos, uh, you see transcribes, and basically each half of a board is reflecting an interview with an individual. And as part of this activity, uh, we map this out because usually if you're a team of six to seven people, you're not able to get to one interview, all of you, right? So you, you need to split. So, but, but the problem with splitting a team is that only half of the team or one third is knowing what was going on in the interview. So therefore you need to find ways as part of the synthesis to debrief what you have learned. And uh, this is one method to do it. So we believe that um, this can work nicely and, and it works nicely. 
So uh, we debrief based on such knowledge within our teams. And yeah, that's me in another situation here, doing basically a similar thing. So the third step is then ideation. So based on all the knowledge that we have collected and based on the insight that we have created and the opportunity field that we have synthesized um, as part of the synthesis, we start with brainstorming. And this is maybe in addition, uh, again, worthwhile to mention, the ideation is not the first step we do. First, we do profound field research. Right? Only if we know something, we can start um, yeah, jumping on that, on that why, and then we, we, we can start ideating. And the ideation is also the, uh, the uh, inflection point where we come from uh, the diverging phase into a converging phase, because here we think about solutions. So in your teaching teams, I'm sure they will teach you different possibilities to ideate. So one is brainstorming, but there are many more methodologies available. There are also quite good handbooks um, that you can maybe use if you run out of ideas how to brainstorm and how to ideate. So then I want to stress a bit the prototyping because ideas are not real, but you need to become real in order to challenge your own ideas with stakeholders and customers. And to do that, we have prototyping uh, being an important part of design thinking. And we are not just doing it at the end, but we start with it from right the beginning on. And at least here at HBI, um, we built prototypes immediately. I mean, already as part of the bootcamp, every team built one. And no matter if it makes sense in, at the end or not, one is for sure, if you try to build serious prototypes and if you fail, you still learn something out of it. Always remember the poster that was shown at Stanford University that I showed you a couple of minutes before. There is no fail. There's only make and learn. So the shape of prototypes, it differs quite big depending on the university and, and, and also the problems. So here you see um, some experience prototypes, for example. And I, I'm not sure if you can see that guy sitting here under the table, right? Uh, so up here, there, there is a testee, right? He's doing something in this paper carton, but everything is basically simulated from the person down here underneath the table. So this already counts as a prototype because it shows in a very simplistic way what you wanted to show. You can test, you can learn, you get feedback, right? And then you move on. Instead of building a highly complicated computer system, so, and if the prototype fails, it's pretty simple. You just throw it away and you build another one, right? If you would have implemented something bigger than that, ah, it's cost already some money. And yeah, it's, it's then maybe problematic to throw it away. This is another prototype, right? Here, um, we, we work together with another pharmaceutical on uh, tracking people within hospitals and also uh, matching probes. So, for example, if you take a blood probe, a blood sample from someone, matching it really to that person. So, and we imagine that every person who is entering the hospital as a patient gets a wristband. So, we just prototyped this simple and quickly, and we were able to test it in minutes. That was another funny low resolution, uh, mid, mid resolution prototype which we uh, built together with Stanford University in, I think in 2008. And the main topic of that prototype was, how can we make video conferencing much better? How can we make the experience better? And believe it or not, but in 2008 already, so 12 years ago, we figured out that it is very much boring for someone if you cannot turn your head, right? If you cannot look around. So, but this is the typical way how we do conferencing. I mean, you cannot move my camera. You only see what I want to let you see. But if you would visit my office, for example, in person, I mean, for sure, you turn around your head, you would see my beautiful office and my view right, that I can enjoy every day. But now you just see my stupid wall of shelves, right? And then some, some private photos. So. 
You, you don't know basically where I am. So, and this prototype was very much simple. It simulated for one single uh, person the possibility to move around your head. And for me, as someone who was sitting uh, on the opposite side, it was able, I was able to see that movement as well. So that's also a prototype. And you see, it was simply made by just fixing, um, at that time, we couldn't afford an iPad. So it was a kind of Android pad, right? I think from Samsung just on that, on that board. Okay, then two more simple ones. Um, that's basically a rough prototype of a machine somewhere in the middle of a project, but already as part of the converging phase. And then later on, we came up with this profound prototype, just to show you the difference, right? That's a final prototype. Uh, that's a prototype in between, right? So final one in between, final one. So this is um, what we are aiming for. Uh, we want to teach you that uh, on the way towards such an awesome solution like shown here on the picture, um, you do a lot of prototyping steps and mostly none of them look fancy. Yeah? Most of them just look at the functionality or at some points in, in the um, experiments. Okay, and then some more around chatbots. So let's skip this. I, or, or maybe let's let's have a look at this. I hope you can see it. I have got endless disease. It means that parts of my body stop working because my cells are attacking my nerves. There's no cure, but the exercise helps. It helps with everyday life. But it's difficult to do all the exercises. Sometimes I forget to do those things, and sometimes I just don't know which exercise to do. We created Abby to remove all the obstacles between an MS patient and their exercise. And one of the biggest challenges we ran into was that no two MS patients are alike, as the disease can affect the whole body or just small parts. And in the end, we created a system that automatically matches a patient to exercises suitable for them. And it does this by asking only two simple questions. The exercises come from a database made specifically for MS patients and Abby can pick and combine them to make a good workout for any patient from wheelchair to walking. At home I have a lot of brochures that uh, my physiotherapist has given me but Abby on the other hand it's one clean single message with instructions on what to do and also at the end it has this uh, funny little animation just to make sure that I get it right. With Abby, I can set the goal for me and find the right exercises which I would normally do. So this is a good thing. Believe me. Yeah, so basically this video is showing um, a final prototype that uh, and a project that we have worked together with Alta University, uh, together with Merck, the pharmaceutical company. And the subject matter that we were looking into was uh, multiple, multiple sclerosis disease. So, but this is uh, now also shown a final prototype. Um, so that brings me to the topic that as part of our project philosophy, um, we are not just building one or two prototypes, but many. And this is just a snapshot of three phases. And in total, we have seven as part of the design thinking curriculum. And as you see in each phase, this team that was RWE in 2018, they built, yeah, sometimes even 20 prototypes. So not just one or two. Yeah. And, uh, and this goes back also to this philosophy that innovation and creativity uh, is a kind of function of work. And at least my HBI students, the HBI team knows it. Um, we discussed this on the weekend already. Um, you, you somehow need to put a lot of effort in something that turns out to be good at the end. So it's hard to find the needle in the haystack, but 
by just grabbing into the haystack just once, right? You might need to look more intensively for that needle in the haystack before you get it. And this is why we do a lot of prototyping from different viewing models. So that leads me to one of the last charts in the prototyping section that um, ex explains again on the horizontal line, the timeline, uh, where we usually start with the low prototyping in the beginning. And then uh, slowly, as soon as we have a better understanding what the problem space looks like, then we start investing into high resolution prototypes, but not in the beginning. Um, that would be a typical corporate do, right? But uh, we start slowly with low resolution prototyping. Okay, and then one of the last steps as part of the circle is the testing procedure. So we try to get back to the field and then we se select a number of um, customers again and users and other stakeholders in order to test what we have done. And especially in the beginning of such projects, team fail or they will fail. I can guarantee if you do it right, you will fail because in most of the situations, you put your own assumptions into that prototyping. And since you are not a user in many cases, your assumptions might be wrong and therefore you fail. But this is the only possible way, at least to me, to uncover what kind of crazy assumptions I have. Then therefore, the early testing, quick testing, the iterative testing approach is of utmost importance. If you miss that, you might run into the pitfall of your own assumptions. And this was a project that we had done with our friends in Colombia once. So with uh, Havana University and the project sponsor was Banco de Occidente in Colombia. And I mean, nowadays it even exists, at least in, in Germany and in Switzerland where I live, I know that such products. We invented at that time uh, banking products that you can just buy in the grocery market. So now it's reality. So we, we said, okay, why not offering a student package or a credit card that you can just purchase, right? So in here we tested this, as you can clearly see that that testing was done in Switzerland. So that's a Swiss brand co-op. Um, but our friends in Colombia, they also tested it. So that was another part of that project. Ah, here is young Marco even visible, <laughs> uh, looking at, at uh, obviously a computer screen. Um, yeah, so uh, sometimes you can even use your faculty to test with, right? And uh, they, they are maybe not the most friendly users, but they give very valuable feedback. Okay, so that's basically the, the cycle. And I'm sure and trust in the teaching team that, will, um, that they will teach you more about this. So maybe at the end for the last four or five minutes, another uh, case just to get you hopefully motivated. And uh, that case of the past has been done together with the company Osram that is at least known in Europe for lighting technology, everything that has a light. So light bulbs used to be part of Osram as well, not anymore, but they started with light bulbs and now they do advanced lighting. So everything that you see in German cars is either from Hella or from Osram. So um, all those products. And they once asked us if we can reinvent the interior lighting of a car. And I mean, if you think about interior lighting of an automobile, it's very hard to imagine what you can improve. Right. There's a, over 100 year history of, of lighting cars. But this team, I don't know if they wanted to accept that challenge, but they had to accept the challenge in the beginning. It was really tough. But what they figured out is that the automotive industry is giving one promise to their customers. And maybe in the chat, you can just guess what, the, what one of the big promises is uh, when you buy in the future, an autonomous car. I hope you, you're still there. I don't see anything in the chat. I'm waiting. Yeah, that you will work, right. Safety, yes. So I just picked the one that uh, convinced me. Uh, so uh, one promise beside 
all the safety, which is absolutely true. Um, and I also believe in it that uh, automated cars will become much better and have superior power in, in terms of safety in regard to, in comparison to human beings. But they also promise um, that uh, you can work. But what do you think is the biggest challenge in an autonomous car when you start working? What, what do you think, what problem might occur? Okay, who said this then? Motion sickness. Do you have motion sickness if I'm allowed to ask that question? Or if, anyway, so, um, so having motion sickness was one of the biggest challenges here that we have um, detected. And only in Europe, it's a big proportion of people who, um, who have that challenge, right? So as soon as you're sitting in a car, and you focus on a newspaper or on something in your close area with your eyes, then um, it happens something in your brain that's called sensory conflict because in your body system, you have two main sensor parts that are able to measure movement. One are the ears and the other one are the eyes. And if the eyes are focused on newspapers or gadgets, then the two sensories they give to the brain different signals. And those different signals are getting wrongly interpreted and then um, you perceive this as a sickness. So, and the team was tackling on a solution and I hope the video works um, in a minute. And they solved the problem of having no movement in the eyes, but a movement visible or perceivable, perceptible in the ears. So let's hope that the video works. Let me click here. Today's world requires us to be online all the time. Technology has enabled us to work from any place at any time. In your office, at a coffee place, and even on the go. However, for many, it is not always that easy to work while traveling. If you are more sensitive to motion, working in a car might be impossible due to motion sickness. This is limiting your productivity, but not anymore. Introducing Wave. Wave is the first portable solution for motion sickness, and it is designed in a way that seamlessly fits into your daily life. It uses smart LEDs with motion sensing technology to visualize patterns that match the movement of the car. When placed next to you, WAVE synchronizes your senses to counteract motion sickness, enabling you to completely focus on your work. WAVE gives you the freedom to work on your own terms in your own time. WAVE for a light ride. So, um... Yeah, so they invented WAVE basically. And to summarize it, um, WAVE is interesting because it is using your peripheral view. So uh, you can test this by yourself. If you look straight to the camera, and then if you move your hands and arms somewhere here, you are still focusing your camera, but at the same time, you are able to see your hands moving. And this is what this system is doing. It simulates movement for your eyes in your peripheral view. And by doing so, you can um, basically um, avoid such effects of getting motion sick. And to finish up, the team was really doing a tremendous effort in testing this. So as you can see here, this was not an in-house uh, in the basement testing. They uh, hired, uh, they, they rented cars, they modified them, they did experiments with reusers in it. Um, they invented different kinds of prototyping setups. 
Um, so not only one, they cared about the angle, they cared about the distance. So everything that was important to figuring this out. They built all the components here, the electrical components, the LED components, even if it looks simple at the end. Yeah? But there, there's a lot of research in it. And this is how it looked from the inside, right? So they tried to simulate a self-driving car by sealing entirely the view to the front page, right? And also to the side. So they just let people sit in that car without having any view to the outside wall, right? But that's a perfect simulation. And it, this team really did a great job. Um, and afterwards, they also did a lot of experiments. And I mean, this is not scientifically proven, so it's not ready for the Lancet Journal, um, but at least to the test they already did. And there were quite a number of people involved. Um, they have quite impressive and uh, promising numbers for the future. So um, that's basically it for me at the end. So, and the mission for tonight was um, to give you a gut feeling um, what the mindset is, to uh, give you a kind of feeling what it means to go through the process. And hopefully I was also able with uh, WAVE, with the Osram project, to inspire you a bit what you can do. I know that at least one autonomous car driving project is in the group as well. Um, but also I want to encourage you to get in contact with your faculty because most of them I know personally since many, many years, they also know a lot of projects and um, they can maybe bring you in contact either with alumni or with the people who have accompanied such teams. So in that regard, I would like to thank you and um, I would like to hand back to um, yeah, some other faculty member who is now um, I'm hosting. Thank you. Thank you, okay, We can do some applause. Yeah, I would really like, uh, as you said, if there is any member of the faculty that want to add something on what Falk uh, said, uh, feel free to. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, I don't want to like force anyone. Yeah, I can see, I don't know. Maybe I can just kind of force Matteo since I know him <laughs> very well. Matteo, you want to add something? I think what Fox um, said about getting the old, the alumni on sugar, it's really important. So be prepared to, you can call everyone from the teaching team and everyone from the previous years. It's really open. Everybody want to share their experience and everything together. Yeah, and uh, that's actually uh, one uh, addition that um, um, I would like to make uh, uh, to Falk's talk because we are really teams of teams. So when you are doing innovation, you should um, really uh, understand that you are not alone, luckily because uh, dancing with ambiguity um, it's uh, it's something that uh, many people are doing around you and as soon as you start uh, following problems and not solution then um, you find uh, yourself with other people uh, like-minded you can really share thoughts and create uh, um, something relevant for uh, your users uh, or your stakeholders. So Sugar is really a network because people trust each other and because uh, uh, there is, um, you know, um, more than 10 years of cumulative uh, knowledge on project innovation and especially people. And um, so really rely not only on your team, but on your extended team inside your company and your extended family around Sugar. Thank you very much, Matteo. I also see Kevin that unmuted himself, probably want to say something. Hello, Kevin. Uh, Mario, um, I think Falk was, uh, as perhaps expected in his presentation, covered most of the material. Um, and I think it was a very good overview of- We don't hear you, Kevin, very well. Sorry. Yeah, this is a feature of today that my microphone is not performing well. So um, okay. hopefully uh, it's working better now. I'll see can yeah. I yeah. adapt. Um, so I think Falk's presentation was very good, as we might expect um, from someone like Falk, and they discovered most of the important material. 
but maybe two additional comments I would make are that when you prototype, um, always have a question in mind. So why are you making this prototype and what are you seeking to find? So prototypes should give you information and also stimulate further ideas. But if you go to make a prototype without having a question in mind, then it's not a good investment of your time. So that's point number one. I think point number two is that it's never too early to prototype. Um, the earlier you start your prototyping, the better, because the more time that you spend with a prototype, the more you fall in love with your prototype. And your prototype is just a means of getting information from your users. So if you fall in love with your prototype, that's dangerous. If your user falls in love with your prototype, that's really good. But prototyping early means that you don't invest so much of your time in the prototype. And when you get the answer, if that answer is no, that's a, still a good answer. It's still good information. But doing that early gets you into the habit of asking good questions, of making, um, making good decisions in your prototyping process, developing your skills and experience. Um, and and it, it makes you much more effective overall. So never, never try to make the prototype perfect. It's not perfect. Um, it just has to be able to ask the question that you want to answer it in your, in your uh, testing. Thank you very much, Kevin. It's really, uh, you guys, you don't know the teaching team yet very well, but it's really like uh, amazing to see the, the passion everyone is, is putting in this, let's say, uh, approach mindset. And I don't know if there is anyone else that want to add something. Okay, I'm just looking at the microphone. Probably we are okay. So uh, before going to, the, I want just to uh, add a little thing. Uh, you uh, guys will know and we'll talk about the same thing for kind of nine months. You will go deep and uh, more and more in deep about this. So today was really like an overview. There are many, many concepts that has, to, uh, that has been stressed and many will be. I would just like uh, say a couple of things. One is, uh, I don't know about you, but I really saw the power of people in the video Falk show, showed really about, uh, uh, okay, uh, also that was really, a, let's say, a particular target because people with that pathology are really like, uh, it, it's not really easy to do an interview, to work with uh, people that have a bit in difficulty. And I really felt the, the power of that video. And another nice thing is, is a funny thing, actually. Uh, it was about asking why. Why is uh, the most powerful thing you can do and you will do in these nine months. And I remember a sentence that was, ask why till it is awkward and then ask a couple of times more. So don't finish when you feel it's, it's awkward. You're gonna get the power of it when you, you start working. Yeah.